Thank you for clicking It's Starting Now. Well, my name's Galaxy. Not really, it's Steph, but Galaxy's fine. Um, and I am here with the Veraxis dev team, which is insane. They have flown here from Baltimore, and now I'm going to butcher this because of my accent. Maryland? Maryland. You did a good job. Did good, yeah. <laughs> so can we get another round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you for joining us here at PAX Australia. Let's jump into some intro, shall we? Yeah, hello. Hey, don't worry about the pronunciation. We were saying Melbourne uh, the entire time <laughs> up until we got on the plane, so yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, I am uh, Matt Quickle. I am a senior lead environment artist at Firaxis Games. Uh, I've been there for 10 years. Uh, I actually was asking people if it's pronounced, if you call it Bloodbin here instead of Bloodborne, but apparently that's not right. Um, my name's Andrew Fredrickson, and I'm a lead producer on Civ 7. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Fitzgerald. I am the lead unit artist on Civ 7, and I've been with Firaxis for 10 years. Hello, I'm Ryan Andrade. I'm the lead concept artist on Civ, and I've been with Praxis for eight years. I've also heard it from these four lovely little birdies that we have something to announce today. But they like to yap. So if time gets away from us, don't let us forget. You want to see it, right? You want to see a new announcement? So remind us, yeah. OK? Because we like Civ. We love Civ. That's why we're here. But before we jump into it, uh, we're going to take another look at Civ 7's gameplay uh, reveal trailer, just so that we can refresh your memories. I know you've already seen it, but we're going to watch it again. Civilization 7 is launching February 11 on PC and consoles, which I don't want to alarm anyone. That's really close. Uh, that's uh, like, Just in time uh, for Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many relationships that's going to affect you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, I will ask you, how does it feel to be finally talking about Civ 7 uh, with the community and strategy fans? It's so exciting. My, my dad is a huge Civ fan. He's always asking for updates, what's going on with Civ 7, and it's, it's great to finally be able to share all the stuff we've been working on with him and the community. That is amazing. I am. Um, I mean, I'm counting down the days. I don't know about you guys. I know you can already play it. You've already rubbed that in I've my face. I've got a spreadsheet for that. <laughs> I mean, the game is a spreadsheet. Well, well, this is the work team. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. But you and I are spreadsheet nerds, right? Yeah. We try to hide it real well. <laughs> <laughs> so we just showed the announced trailer, but you actually dropped a 25 minute long uh, gameplay showcase Roll. during your announcement. <laughs> that's what you're here for, by the way, that's it, yeah. Um, no, but we do have a clip from that. So can we show that, please? Something we hear often from players is about how when you play a game of Civ, you forget the world around you. Video games, more than any other medium, have this ability to completely immerse you in another universe. Whether it's through art, music, cinematic moments, or language, our goal is to bring your Civ world to life. Getting the look and feel for Civilization VII right is critical, so it's important to make sure we are capturing that through our art style. I spent a lot of time as a kid in museums, especially in the diorama sections, and being able to walk by and see these little miniatures that aren't moving, but there's a story told in them was something that I always found intriguing. Technology changes every time we put one of these games out, and each time we put one out, we can do more. And we're at a spot in the industry now where we've just got a lot of, a lot of tools and a lot of power under our belts to represent the entire world of civilization. We're hoping that the players can look into this game, see the diametric detail on this, and tell their own stories that they've never told before. Everything is going to fit together in such a different way than it has in the past from Civilization, and I think it's going to give you a much more realistic version of the simulation that you're trying to create. We took a lot of what we learned in Civ 6 and learned from that, trying to open up some more spaces and everything, and we adjusted the tone from 6 a bit, and I think that's what our fans are, are looking for, and I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun for them. It's something that nobody else is doing, and nobody but Firaxis can do. I think players will love how combat looks. We greatly expanded the variety of units in Civ 7. Units now constantly engage one another. You'll see and hear the clashing of swords and steel. Units have a higher level of fidelity than ever before. Everything from the little parts and pieces and details on the armor set to the entire representation of a whole army on the battlefield. I feel like this is going to become your Civ. Like, this is, this is the one. It has the look. <laughs> definitely 
got that right. When you play Civ, you lose the world around you. You one more turn yourself into oblivion. Next thing you know, it's 3.30 in the morning. You've got to get up at 5.30 to go to work. And yeah, we've all been there. We do it at work, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was Jason, your senior art director. In that clip that uh, we showed, they talked a lot about the art direction that you took for Civ 7. And we are going to get to that and dig into that more. But first, let's put it into context. I, yeah, Civ has just this, obviously, a huge legacy. Not only we're trying to put all of you know, world history, or at least as much as we can, but it's got so many years of expectation that trying to make sure that we get something that's uh, consistent but also new and exciting, something that feels familiar but fresh. Uh, it's a huge challenge, but it's also an exciting one at the same time. I mean, it's been around for 30 years now? Yeah. 30 years. Yeah, we've added tons of more detail and diversity to every single corner of the game. Um, every asset is overflowing with story and functionality, and we're really hoping that encourages players to zoom in and experience it in a new way. I'm very excited to see more. I, even just like the, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the difference in the trees. I noticed that. I noticed. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm very excited. There's more. <laughs> There's more about trees, yep. guys. More about trees. So obviously there's big shoes to fill. We're, like I said, 30 years. We're talking 30 years and we have a lot of dedicated fans to Civ. What was the creative process like deciding on this new direction for Civ 7 style? Well, um, you know, I remember um, going over to Jason Johnson's house and uh, kind of getting together and geeking out about uh, what Civ could be. We put on some good uh, movies and music and we started to uh, write down some, uh, some scribbles that day. Um, and uh, in some ways, it's our very first uh, piece of artwork for the game, you know? But uh, we realized that we were signing up for a lot of, a lot of work to, uh, to come ahead. But uh, those really became the, the, guiding, um, the guiding direction for the look of Civ. Yeah, uh, for Civ 7, you could probably beautifully package up the term readable realism as the direction in which we went. And what that really means is that we wanted to focus on like, historical diorama, something that you may see like, at a museum or tabletop game or whatever. Like, and we wanted to be able to look at the, the forms and the textures and the materials but then also figure out how can we dial that information down so that it's readable from a variety of different zooms mm -hmm. and uh, how it has a sort of tactile feel to it and also just how it can complement the gameplay. Well, it certainly looks stunning from what we've seen. Obviously, subject to change because it's all, you know, pre-footage. We're pretty close, don't yeah, worry. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic looking spreadsheet. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> uh, <laughs> you've done it well. You've done it well. Uh, Matt, you're the lead environmental artist, Trees. Judging from that gameplay trailer we showed, a lot of environment. Look, I jumped ahead. There's a lot of environment in the game. What is new? What can you tell us that's new about the environment in this game? Well, I mean, I, I would say like coming from Civ 6 to Civ 7, you know, we, we do have a lot of similarities in terms of like the amount of biome diversity, but the, the biomes itself, like the map that you're looking at, <laughs> encompasses the largest thing that you see. So we wanted to make sure that we put in a lot of detail on this game and, uh, and bring it to like just the higher, a higher fidelity and add a, a subtlety to it that you've never seen before. Uh, one of the complications, of course, of doing that is how we can make it, you know, performant on all of the different platforms and how we can just afford to be able to do all of it in the time that we have. And so this required us to sort of think about our pipelines and our processes and how we, we utilize uh, tools in a different way. Uh, so in this particular uh, shot here, you can see that there are a lot of different variations of mountains, for example. And in previous Civ games, we use height maps to do that. But in order to meet the visual target of our art direction, where the mountains felt like you could pick them up and feel them and stick your finger in every nook and cranny, uh, we wanted to be able to, we had to do it a different way. And uh, <laughs> I love <milk> and <laughs> we had to do it a different way. So uh, we actually uh, used Houdini to uh, create a rock generator and, and then made different forms that we could uh, sort of speed up the process and get it in there as quickly as possible. Um, so that really helped us to sort of uh, bring the art direction up really quickly and iterate. Um, the, the second thing are the trees. There are a lot of trees in the game. And, uh, uh, I was into something. Yeah, and um, th that was primarily, um, an artist on our team whose name is Dean, and he did a lot of the foliage for our game. And he developed, again, these Houdini uh, pipelines to make it so that we could not only like make an initial tree, but also that we could optimize it appropriately. Or if, if we came in, the art director and myself said, hey, like, make it a little bit taller, or add like an extra uh, canopy to it, or remove a few leaves, just for that sort of readable realism, he could do it very quickly. And by developing those pipelines and processes, it, you know, and making it so that we can iterate quicker, it allows us to make more. So um, yeah, so that was really exciting. One other thing that we have in the game uh, that fans may have noticed is a lot more elevation. And uh, so we have like cliffs in the game that, that have been in some of our screenshots. Um, and coming from Civ 6, we had hills, and we knew that hills were gonna be problematic because there's elevation changes everywhere now. So one of the cool instances when environment got to uh, work with design, uh, we presented, hey, like, we would like to do these rough terrain tiles, which allowed for these sort of chunky rock forms that we, we felt would organically blend into our mountain ranges better, uh, but also serve the purpose of game design. 
And they were like, that's so awesome. Let's do that. And uh, we were really excited because that was like a win-win situation for art and design. It was, an, it was like this really cool iteration where they had you know, a lot of stuff and you couldn't quite tell what was what, but then through those systems, they were able to like, turn a lot of knobs. And now when you're moving your units around, it's like, oh, I understand why I can't go there or my movement is slowed down. And like those, uh, the cliffs, the escarpments is one of my favorite additions they have. So now you can put like an archer on top and shoot down and they can't get you. Have the high ground. Yeah, you gotta watch out for the high ground. I heard it's good. <laughs> if you went solid before. Anakin knows, you know. <laughs> I think what is really great about that is that the big thing about Civ games is exploring, right? So you get your scout and you go and explore. And you're just going to have so much that you're going to be able to see just based on even the screenshots that you've shown and what you're telling us with the, the different varieties and things like that. But you're never going to know what you're going to find, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it goes without saying that unanimously, Civ players love exploration. Um, and so, you know, we love to watch the fog of war just fall back. And it could always either be something that's dangerous around the corner or it could be something really exciting. So, um, you know, obviously one of the things that you, 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 can, you can run into when the fog of war disappears is uh, natural wonders. And um, we have one that we're showing today here, which everybody should be uh, pretty excited about. This is our Great Barrier That's Reef. That's time. Yes, yes. It's what it's called in game now, I guess. Yeah. Is that a cross crossover? <laughs> Confirmed here. Yeah. <laughs> Disney execs. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is a Great Barrier Reef. Um, and I, I like this shot because it just, it, it feels like a postcard. Um, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is a, is a four hex natural wonder. It's one of our, our largest natural wonders, and it uh, provides bonuses for science, um, as well as uh, food and happiness. And I, I remembered that because food makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and you all have great food Have here, you tried Tim Tams yet? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> is this real or is she joking about this? <laughs> <laughs> right. People have been messing with me since I got here, so I have no idea. No, which they're good, they're good athletes, of course. But what is not good is the dangers. You said fog of war, turn around the corner, could be something nice like food or the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> but dangers. What kind of dangers might players uh, encounter. Yeah, so uh, natural disasters are, are back in the game. And, um, you know, one of the things that we, we wanted to do is just, like everything, is bring it up to that next level. And, uh, you know, like it's a pretty big challenge, but um, we took a look at the, the systems that the designers had, and then um, we had our environment artists, and, and more importantly, the uh, VFX artists, they just did an incredible job of like taking this to the next level and bringing like a level of nuance that you, uh, you've you never seen before. I personally like love the first time that uh, our VFX lead, Thomas, showed the thunderstorms and you just saw the little hail coming down from it. It was so awesome. It was on someone else's city? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome when it's not yours. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's, you know, like Matt said, we're bringing environmental, uh, these disasters forward and that, you know, that was something we added in six uh, in an expansion, but having them from the, the base game here for Civ 7 is awesome and exciting. You know, so when you're out, uh, you know, you're, you're going to find spots. Your volcano might be in a great spot, but you might not want to settle it. It's a risk reward, sort of keeping that gameplay interesting in the environment, telling that story. But sometimes there are just disasters that occur. You know, you get storms that show up. They don't, they don't sort of have a spot on the map. So they'll come across the map and watching them, you know, come through sort of can affect, do I want to run away from it or try and weather the storm? Especially because uh, it's turn by turn, right? You're yeah. watching that imminent danger. Yeah. And you have to press next turn. You, you do if you want to keep playing, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think there's even, like, there's more danger now. And obviously, natural disasters are one kind, but um, we haven't talked a whole lot about it. But when we get to the exploration age, you're going to go, you know, antiquity, you're not out in the ocean as much. And uh, you can't, basically, you're, you're uh, constrained. You've got to stay in the shallows because it's antiquity. We aren't ready for the deep ocean. It's scary. Uh, when you move into the exploration age, you can start venturing out there, but you've got to deal with, you know, damage and risk and consequences. So, you know, going out on the map isn't always just like going out safe and finding treasures and goody huts. It's going out there looking out for, you know, threats. As, you know, from the environment or even just the ocean itself. So there's no more getting a boat and just click auto. Not explore. right away. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta get ready for it because you know you couldn't do that right away in antiquity with the very first ships. So you had to get stuff that was ready for the, the deep waters and understand how to navigate okay. and all that kind of stuff. We have a tech tree that helps you unlock things. Oh, <laughs> based on a spreadsheet. Yeah, based yeah. on a spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the world of the game looks amazing, but what about the cities? I've seen. They also look amazing. Yeah, yeah. Are they also spreadsheeted? Confirmed. I've seen sprawl, which to me as an archaeologist, a bit of galaxy lore. Seeing the city not confined to that one hex and kind of sprawling out a bit is pretty nice. How did you approach it diff differently then? Yeah, so we will talk about uh, sprawl. Um, I, I wanted to talk about building the actual buildings themselves. I mean, I, I love architecture. I love shapes and forms. Um, you can just ask these guys. Uh, you have a lot of really cool architecture here. And they would he, say, let's He was walking around and we kept losing them. He's like, hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. They, would, they, they, they would say, it's 20 minutes to this place. I said, you better give us 30 or 40 because <laughs> I'm gonna I take pictures of everything. So I, I love architecture. Um, and in Civ 6, uh, I was the structure lead on that project. And you know, we, we did this really cool thing where we made an individual palace uh, for each Civ. And uh, we went on to Civ Fanatics and uh, there was a whole thread about uh, our fans conjecturing, like, which buildings did they use to make this palace and which one? And they were a lot of times spot on, you know, uh, it, but it was really cool to watch our fans get so interested in the things that we were interested in. So in Civ 7, we wanted to take that approach and do it for everything. So here's an example that you can see. This is a villa in the game, and there is a Roman uh, Han China and an Indian version of, of the buildings. Um, so now when you play the game, you're going to get that variety. And we're just really excited about that. Um, this additional work, of course, 
like I mentioned with terrain, required us to think about our processes and pipelines. We <clears throat> developed a new method for developing kits, and we also had um, one of uh, civilization's first universal shared material library to be able to do all of this. So it was cool to see like the, the technology that we used to do all of it, but more importantly is what it does for both our developers and for our fans. You know, coming to work every day, there's like a different variety of uh, things that folks are like excited about. And, you know, uh, we had an individual on the project, uh, his, uh, his name is Logan. And when he first came onto the project, we had, we only had a Persian building set. And he's like, you know what, Matt, I love India. And I'm like, I love India too. And he goes, can we make an Indian building set? I said, probably not. We just don't have time right now. And he said, well, what if I came up with a solution? And I said, sure, if you want to like write up a proposal and bring it back to me, I'm happy to, to entertain the idea. The next day, I think it was, he came in, not with a written proposal, but with an actual model that he had made using like pieces from the Persian set plus additional pieces he had made. Oh, he was up all he, yeah, he was, he was, just one more building. Yeah, just one more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he, he simultaneously like worked on like the entire set. So um, like we just love that our uh, developers are that excited. And we really hope that the fans will, will also appreciate all of those little details that we put into the variations. I mean, we're watching the cities and they all look different as you're going through and I'm curious during the game based on how you put stuff down, how it expands, it's incredible. I think that's really exciting because it's gonna give people another reason to try out a different sieve, right? Maybe they wanna see how their city grows. Um, and I can see that I did get ahead of myself here because the next question was about Sprawl. Yeah, that's, so, okay. that's okay. We can, we can type that. <laughs> um, there you go. Uh, so the cities, they spread across the map more. Ryan, I feel like you have something to say about that. Right, I believe we have a video to show with this of a Khmer city. Can we get that playing? We do. We do have a video. Perfect. Right, so right, guys, six, video. Yeah, we'd have a single city hex, and you have these little district tiles next to it, and it, it kind of simulated urban sprawl. Um, but now with this video, um, you're seeing a Khmer city set in Civ 7. You can really see how much more dense the cities are becoming, um, and you can feel the spread of your empire across continents. Yeah, it's, it's the, uh, a lot of it's that, you know, not only do we have those, uh, what we call hero buildings, like those ones that we just saw a few minutes ago, but it's the population buildings that like fill in around them and help give all that identity. You see it grow across the map. Like little housing buildings. Yeah, little housing, all that. that. It's just sort of something to help define that city, the urban spaces from the, you know, more rural spaces, but still the same city. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um, but it does sound like a lot of these changes aren't just driven by art design. As you mentioned, you had to develop different processes and things like that. So, um, but also gameplay mechanics, which you did mention with the, the hills and the escarpments and the terrain yeah. changes. There's a lot of changes around here. Like, you know, looking at the city growth that you have on here, um, you know, you see that one navigable river, that navigable, actually two, they're, they're all everywhere. Uh, that's a huge example of like changing the gameplay and how these things work. So not only do we have different art assets that go in and around the rivers, uh, but you're gonna change where you wanna build and how you wanna grow. So, you know, it used to be, if you wanted to be a seafaring sieve, you needed to establish at least one city on the coast. Now you might just build by a navigable river and, you know, sort of send your people out from there. Or conversely, you might have to worry about people sailing up the river and attacking you. So a, a lot more threats are visualized and gameplay is visualized like even more directly on the map. Uh, one of my favorite things is that like the rivers are built, not just randomly, like usually you find, oh, the water comes out of the mountains and forms the the minor rivers and then those minor rivers get together and turn into a big navigable river. So it's a lot of logic and a lot of gameplay and a lot of visuals all working together. And like in the cities, you see a, a big difference between, uh, we have cities and towns. Uh, so every time you, you start with your capital, that's the first thing you build. After that, every settler you make starts a town. And a town is something that, uh, you know, it still claims it's got your hex, it's got your borders and that's yours, but it doesn't have a production queue. All the resources it generates go back to your empire, to your nearby cities. So you don't, you can uh, claim the territory, but you don't have to manage it. So it's sort of a way where that works. But what's really cool is that means that all you're getting, you're not building buildings, so that town stays small. And as it grows, you're claiming uh, rural tiles. So you build improvements out on those, so log more logging camps and mines. And eventually, if you want to grow that, you can say, okay, I'm ready to convert this, this town into a city. And then you start seeing the, the urban center grow as you make those buildings and the population center sort of starts to creep out into the, uh, take over the rural tiles. So you can sort of see the gameplay and the art working together to communicate both to your own sis, but also where you're attacking, because we always attack. Uh, you're not peaceful? No. I don't know, I go for a science victory all the time. Maybe that's just because I'm a bit nerdy, but that actually sounds like players are going to have a lot more to think about and strategize about where they're putting the new towns and like you said, developing them from the town to the city. I think that's yeah. actually, it's I'm a, really excited. It's a lot of things where it's like, we want to give you options without making it incredibly more complex. So now you can, if you don't, you want to have more territory, but you don't want to have more to manage, this is a way to do it. Yeah, awesome. So you can, you can easy it. Easy mode? Uh, I wouldn't call it easy, I'd call it different. <laughs> fair, 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 fair. Um, <clears throat> well, we've spoken about buildings, trees, uh, escarpments, rivers, navigable, Man, it's, I can't it, say. It is navigable? Really hard to say. Can we navigable. change that word? All parts of the English language. I, I, I called them big rivers while we were making big rivers. Yep. 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 Big rivers. We got that. Okay. Cool. But what about unit design? <laughs> so, John, your main focus is the unit design, and with so many different sieves that now also have different looking buildings and things like that, mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of units to think about. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. You know, when we first started off, we had one simple little small goal to uh, to achieve, and that's why don't we just go ahead and recreate all of human history? It's all time, all peoples, all culture, all clothing, all armor, all weapons to so, be fair in the history in the history of the universe we're like this it's yeah, yeah. yeah. it's, it's a lot of stuff yeah, yeah. it's a lot of stuff <laughs> so we knew that we had uh, some pretty big shoes to, to fill so if we want to talk about how many units there are let's try to break it down actually wait a minute I have a PAX Australia exclusive uh, piece of news. Do you guys want to hear it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, all right. So check this out. <clears throat> if you get the Shawnee pre-order bonus, 
you will be playing with 31 civs on day one. And that is more than any other civilization game uh, for civs on day one. Yes? All right, come on. But that's an important number to keep in mind. So there's 31, right, uh, civs. And every civ has a unique military unit. They also have a unique civilian unit. Some of those civs will have great people. Uh, people, people. There's 10 great people per great people. It is absolutely incredible how many units there are. Not to mention the uh, standard units, the, the, you know, the archers and the warriors and, and trebuchets and that sort of thing. So that is also there, all of the rank and file. So yeah, we have tons and tons of uh, units, hundreds, hundreds of units uh, to, to choose from. But there's also a new ages mechanic. So did that add to your workload with your unit design? Oh, I don't know if it added to it, but it, it absolutely helped shape it. I mean, I, I love the age system. The design team absolutely out, outdid themselves with it. Uh, you know, one of the things that the age system means for me is, uh, you know, it allows us to kind of like focus our efforts. Every single age has a, a bit more of a theme, and the things that are important in one age um, may not be uh, may be automated in the next age. Uh, so it allows us to focus up our efforts. <laughs> we got nine units down there, but every single one of those units represent um, one of the sub eras to each age. We wanted to make sure that you receive a, a strong start, middle, and end every single time you play an age. So. Uh, if we look at this lineup, we have, uh, well, down at the bottom, Antiquity, Exploration, and Modern. It starts off uh, with uh, kind of like uh, uh, warring city-states, Proto-Greeks, then followed by Greeks, followed by the Roman Empire. Um, the Exploration Age goes into um, the Norman Invasion, then the height of chivalry, followed by the uh, kind of a Renaissance period, which is, which is awesome for exploration. I mean, that's when they're finding, uh, you know, the, the new land and distant lands, you know? Um, and, uh, and then, of course, once you find some distant land, what do you want to do? You want to plant a flag, right? Start of imperialism with, um, with uh, the, Napoleonic era, er, the, the Napoleonic era, followed by World War I and then World War II, as you start to master uh, mechanized warfare. That is, well, one, that's a lot of units that look different which is well done. They look there's great. More. Oh, <laughs> we've got a little bit more, don't worry about it. You definitely, no, 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 there's nine units. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all you get. <laughs> you definitely didn't copy and paste them to make your job easy though, did you? No way, absolutely not. Now, I mean, look, every single unit is a brand new opportunity to make one of our fans' favorite unit in the game. It's very important to us that we give each one a, a huge amount of TLC, tender love and care. Okay, well, look at that thing. Okay, so um, here's an example of uh, one of the units in the game, the Phalanx, which is a uh, late uh, antiquity unit. So if you look all the way over to the left, you can see that there's Roman, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, African, all the way to South American. So it's, it just showcases like one unit, but all of the different looks and armor sets that uh, define all of these different cultures. You know, sometimes we had to, um, uh, we had to do a little bit of concept work and we had to uh, uh, fill in the gaps that uh, historically didn't exist, but I'm incredibly proud of the entire team. They, they did a great job of, of uh, making sure that everything is uh, uh, culturally authentic, even if it's not 100% historically accurate. But when you refer to a unit, so in previous Civ games, and we've seen in the, the trailers and things, we're not talking about one guy standing no. there, right? So they have different models for, that make up one unit. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, internally we call that, you know, the unit is the group, the, 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 what you'd see in the game. But within that, there's a bunch of different members. All right, so here we have uh, one example. This is the, um, uh, the man-at-arms, and it's kind of like a medieval mercenary group. And you can see here that uh, the, the man-at-arms is made up of many different characters uh, or members, uh, different, uh, different weapons, different animation sets, uh, different shields, different armor configurations. This is all done you know, in, a, in an effort to make all of the characters feel real, like they're real people coming from their homes and lands and, and joining into battle, but uh, uh, not just a bunch of little droids. Yeah, it's different. Like every time, these are in the same game. These are both the same unit. Yep. Different composition. Composition every time you create them. Yeah, it's actually really cool. We have this awesome uh, editor. Uh, I wish we could ship with that too. But uh, every time you hit random seed, it's a completely different uh, generation of uh, different uh, unit configurations. Yeah, because like, yeah, all those are different parts yep. get swapped by the system. Absolutely. Now you did mention combat. Who here likes to wage war in Civ? Heads up. Heads oh, come up. on, more hands. Oh. Do we want to hear more about combat then? <laughs> I think it's a good segue. We got, have to do it. We know what yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to. So, what's new with the combat system then? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm so incredibly proud of the new combat system. Uh, you know, I worked on Civ 6, and um, I, I was a part of uh, that go as well. And uh, actually, we have, a, we have a quick example of Civ, Civ 6 combat. Yeah, all right. Looking good, looking good, that's nice. Yeah, get him. Okay, there we go. All right, so, you know, again, like, that was really great. But, you know, one of the things that Jason really wanted to bring to the forefront is gameplay, you know? And when you're moving around units, we want to make sure that the gameplay is quick and responsive. You as the player, you're setting the tone and the, the, the speed of the game. So, like, <clears throat> what we wanted to do was address that combat so that it feels instant. The moment you click, you, you warp directly into combat and you start to receive... Oh, that's fine. All right, let's let this play. Go ahead. This is a prototype. Device. Prototype. All prototype. <laughs> so is the tundra. Yeah. OK. I definitely got scared by the noise. I didn't realize the video was playing. Yeah, so. yeah I'm sorry. It, it sounds off. very different on these speakers. Yeah. I was like, whoa, are we on the <laughs> I was like, did something break over there? No, but what, what, 
this prototype kind of sh shows, and, and this was developed by one of our um, uh, animators, Alex. He did an amazing job of, of making sure that every time you click, the action is very responsive. Then we allow the characters to go into what we call continuous combat until the beginning of the next turn. So when you hit next turn, they work back to their uh, start position, uh, they tidy up the battlefield, and they're ready for more orders. I think we got a video, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah, so this, this video here showcases the, 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 combat, the continuous combat, and I absolutely love it because you're just a few clicks away from an entire battle raging across the entire map. Hey, what's, what's really cool is uh, yeah, we're, we're zoomed in real close so we can see it here, and uh, one of the things that's awesome is when you're playing and they get into this combat, you can see who's engaged with what, and then that means you can use that information to flank. So it's not just, it, it is visual and it's awesome, it's also gameplay information. So you can say, okay, I'm gonna start with this one and then I can flank it with these two other units. So keeping that, that tie between the visuals and the mechanics is you know, just incredibly awesome and, and obviously makes it easier to play. And that's going to allow you to have the high ground with your arches <laughs> on the newest comments. Until I flank yours. No, 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 I just say no to that, no, no. But there is a new hero on the battlefield as well, right? Yeah, we got the uh, the commander units, and these are these are incredibly powerful units that you bring out. And you know, obviously, in, in Civ, we've had for a while all kinds of representations of uh, experience and leadership and how that manifests. And now that's brought onto sort of one place with these commanders. They're they're the units that gain XP now. So if you have a commander near the battlefield, any fighting that happens in their area is going to give them XP. They're going to be able to increase and unlock their bonuses and uh, carry that forward to any troops that are there. In addition to that, the commanders can sort of hoover up and pack in all the nearby units up to their limit and then march them across the map much easier. You can even they even have some cool abilities where they can sort of do overwhelming attacks if you find some stragglers out in the wild. Uh, I'll let John talk about how cool the, the variety. Oh yeah, I mean, the, the variety is intense. We really wanted to make sure that, um, you know, as many civs as possible had unique commanders. And we wanted to spend some time there because of all the great gameplay that's uh, tied to it. Uh, actually, one of my favorites coming up real quick. Oh yeah, look at this one. It's Egypt, it's hot. They have to have some fans on. It's good stuff. So we wanted to showcase power in like different sort of ways. More military troops are just in style. We have a lot of musicians playing there as well. A lot of entourage members to really showcase all of the, uh, the um, uh, upgrades that your commander gets while they're uh, gaining XP. I look so good. Is it February yet? <sighs> well, I mean, I guess that does segue into to another section that is also very, very exciting. Uh, we did talk about the world and how the empires you can build into it, how you can develop your empire to convert your towns from rural to cities. But what about the people who populate the world? Yeah, it's actually really awesome because we, we looked really hard at the mechanics and the representation and thought, you know, how do we take what you have early on to the next level? And you know, in Civ 6, you're used to being able to find the villages and the barbarians that are out there. Uh, and there's a new attempt uh, to sort of recognize that similar gameplay. So you're, you're going to find independent powers out on the map. And no more barbarians, no more villages. And these independent powers, uh, some of them might be hostile. You can choose to fight them. You can choose to run away if you're one of those people. Uh, or you can choose to engage with them in diplomacy. And it's really exciting because if you are able to find some, even the hostile ones, you can start uh, spending some of that influence, getting to know them, and eventually convert them from hostile to neutral and maybe even help them become a city state and be their suzerain and get some really cool bonuses out of it. So you're, you're not just, uh, it's not a monolithic idea of barbarians. Or, or just every, uh, every, in, every village is something to go get a bonus out of. There's stories, there's interactions, there's gameplay. Uh, I think we might have it. I'm not sure if it's in here, uh, but we've, you know, there's also really cool, like when you go to those independent powers and you engage in Diplomacy. You get to see, uh, here we go, we got some of them. These are the uh, sort of representation of them on the screen. Uh, John surprised us all with his team pulling this one off. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, we figured, hey, if you're sitting on a gold mine, you, you gotta share it with all the townspeople, right? Uh, the, the units we knew looked great on the battlefield, but uh, independent powers really allowed us an opportunity to bring them uh, uh, closer to the, to the camera, and uh, you can really see all of the charming details and, and, um, and all the care that has gone into it. I mean, every unit, we really wanted to make sure that it, it's, uh, you'd wanna make a 3D print and like put it right on your, uh, on your desk. Um, but these little vignettes uh, do more than just simply look great. They, they also indicate what independent powers' um, strengths are. So here we have, um, you know, military science, maybe a little bit of green um, uh, with uh, economy. Um, it really has changed everything from uh, kind of faceless barbarians to many civilizations themselves. And we wanted to use that as a tool to help you get even more immersed in the world. Oh, look at these animations. Wow, the, the animation team did an amazing job uh, with these independent powers, a lot of uh, character and uh, care went into them. But you can see that there's a, these uh, great little vignettes behind them that uh, also indicate like, what are some of their intentions or what are they interested in? Yeah, this is them full screen when you go into their diplomacy. Yeah. yeah. That's actually, I'm really excited about this independent powers thing because I'm sure you've all played a match of Civ where for whatever reason there's like a bajillion barbarians near your Civ and they just won't <laughs> let you progress and then you lose, right? And it's all because of the barbarians. It doesn't matter what you try to do. For whatever reason they're seated next you to you. You have to fight them. I think I went over that. Yeah, but <laughs> science, Andrew, science. Sorry, no, we have you can't science people. Well, actually, no, I hold on. Can. Back again. Yeah. It's frowned on in some ways. As a bioarchaeologist, I science dead people. <laughs> so it works, but you had to fight them first. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. no, 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 I did not do that. Um, okay, well, you're in charge, Ryan, of doing some research to, because you're doing the concept design and things like that, and we have just seen that all of these units, all of these buildings, they are unique, they are wonderful looking, 
How much research did that take to make sure that you are trying to accurately represent them as best you can? It's a ton of research, and we try to have multiple phases of like vetting what we find. So it starts off with our concept team. We're gathering our own stuff, and then we talk to our in-house historians, and they give it a second pass. Um, and sometimes we're able to connect with a cultural advisor that can inform us on a specific culture and make sure we're depicting them respectively and uh, authentically. Uh, I think we got an example. Yep. So here's some concept sketches of the Shawnee leader um, Tecumseh. These were done by Mike, uh, Mike Tassie. Um, and this is an example of like where our first step would be. Um, and we review this internally. And once we think it's up to snuff for us, we'll send it off to uh, our connection with uh, Chief Barnes and the Shawnee tribe. And we went back and forth with them, and they were like, okay, what's working? What's not working? What would you like to change? Is anything here not authentic? We've got another image after this one. Yeah, and so this is uh, close to the final. Um, we've got some call-outs here. These are typically for modeling teams, so they know how to model all those little details um, and little, little accents. Um, but it's also great that we can send it to Shawnee and be like, hey, here's these little things that they might have been a scribble in the concept. Here's the picture of the museum piece that we're referencing. Does this work out? Does it line up? I think we, I remember, like, I think it was those earrings. They're like, yeah, you, you had the wrong ones. Here, take these and put those in there. Mm -hmm. It's really cool to see it. I'm forgetting something. Oh yeah, we got the last image here up to come say. It was such an amazing back and forth. Every single Shawnee asset we did, we went back and forth with them, and they were such an amazing partner, and we're also happy with the result. It looks very good. Yeah, our leaders are really cool. I, you're right though, there was something we were there supposed to talk about. Where'd they say? Supposed to remind us? I yeah, I, does someone remember? Yeah. Oh, you want a new leader? Yeah. Louder. Okay, I already guessed. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have something new. Chun Chuck and her sister Chun Mi led a multi ethnic coalition against the Han Dynasty, resisting the political and cultural assimilation of Vietnam. As such, Chung Chuck disapproves of leaders who aggressively build up powerful commanders. To edge out rivals, she gets a head start and extra growth behind her own commanding forces. Mastery of tropical terrain grants some excellent science bonuses, especially when Chung Chuck holds an aggressive stance. So be sure to take advantage of the jungle's bountiful resources when establishing your empire. Consider pairing Chok Chok with the Khmer civilization in the antiquity age to take even more advantage of the lush, wet terrain. Or choose a different path all your own. But whatever you build, remember to build something you believe in. That was awesome. I didn't see any of that promo material beforehand. I think I was maybe supposed to, but that was my first time it seeing it. It was in your notes. I think it says Trump Tracker. I mean, I knew what, who it was. I didn't see the video. <laughs> Can we get a round of applause, please? A world exclusive for PAX Australia from our amazing Paraxis devs. Thank you so much for talking to us about Civ. I'm very excited. I wish it was February now. It is not. We have to wait. These guys can play now in their hotel room. <laughs> How disgusting is that? <laughs> I thought we were friends. But we do have a little bit more time. We're not quite at 12, so we do have a little bit of a community Q&A um, that we had um, cu curated from the Civ community. We're going to do it rapid fire, so anyone can jump in, OK? Uh, Cot Peter asks, how did player feedback on past Civ entries influence Civ 7's art direction? Yeah, so I mean, we're always listening to player feedback. Um, the main driving force for Civ 7's art direction was readable realism, the, the term that our art director coined. Um, and that was all about adding detail that's worth zooming into that's still readable from afar. And everything that we did with Civ 7 was in service of that goal. You're so good. You're so good at what you do. <laughs> I'm very impressed. I, I'm an archaeologist, what was, till I played games for a living. So just like seeing someone put so much love and care into the research behind things, like all of you, it's very nice to see as somebody who spent a lot of time doing the history stuff. So thank you for one. But we do have another quick question. Alt Ghost Enthusiast asks, how do you weigh historical accuracy versus recognition and aesthetics? Does balancing time and resources factor into it? I'll take this one. Uh, yeah, so that's correct. Uh, Every game is about balancing your, your time and your resources. And, you know, Civ has a big library, right? As, as uh, Fitz over there said earlier, like we, we want to make the entire world and we want to do, do it through all ages. So what we do is we really just try to find like the best balance between like design choices that we make and what works for a wide uh, range of different civilizations. Um, and, you know, there have been instances in the past where we've done that and then we've had extra time later to come in and add uh, additional uh, buildings or, or, or whatever into the game. And, and that's something that we're always willing to uh, do. Um, so that's not off the table. Well, I, I think on, the other thing I want to add is like the flip side of that. Like this team's always listening. So even as we make stuff and it gets in the game, it might even be in the game for you know months or, or long, even longer. And then by the time we get it out in front of you know our marketing team or user research or some other groups that are involved, they'll say, hey, you shouldn't do that. That doesn't go there. That's not the right way to use it. So we're also taking things off and adjusting them even after they were done. So you know, as much as we try to be efficient, we also want to make sure that we're not scared of spending resources to make sure we're doing it uh, as right as we can. I remember even, I think it was a couple of days ago, I was talking to someone here, like, hey, you need to make it. I was like, oh, okay, we'll fix that when we get back. So. And you have 31 civs to start with, right, for yeah. Civ 7, so that's we'll a huge right. undertaking. <laughs> okay, at least one. Just, just, just one. Can it be Augustus? No. He's my favorite. <laughs> Very excited. Yeah, you told me that, but you don't know them all. You can't have favorites yet. He's on my arm. He's my favorite. <laughs> okay, I can't argue with that. <laughs> all right, we actually have one last question from Striking Shower 1055 like these names. 
What was the devs' favorite part of working on Civ 7? I feel like you can all answer a part of this because you probably have different favorites, right? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the storytelling. It's getting down to the nitty gritty of the buildings or the characters and trying to tell a story and explain the purpose of this asset visually. Um, I think when all those little bits come together in the, in the procedural world that is Civ, it's a really amazing thing to see. Yeah, for me, uh, my favorite part of working on Civ 7 is the team at Firaxis. You know, we have a motto, people first, and a lot of the, our teammates have worked at Firaxis for a very long time, you know. But we're not just co-workers, but we're, we're teammates, and we're, we're friends. Um, it, it's great to see, it, it's never like it's just some cold Jira task is moving from the open to completed, sorry, buddy. Uh, but it's, it's more like we're doing this, we're doing this for each other, and uh, we want to make the best game possible. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a, a piece of work exchange hands, you know, from design to art, um, animation, sound work, visual effects, and of course the engineers that kind of bring it all together. And I've seen a good idea become a great idea. I've seen that become a, just an absolute game changer. And it's only because we're all working together and doing our absolute best to make the best game that we can. That's so wholesome. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoy moving cold hard JIRA tasks into the done column. <laughs> No, I, I, uh, we, we, we rehearsed this, believe it or not, this is as good as it gets. Um, I had a different answer in the, when we talked yesterday, and then I had a different one I was going to say here, and I think it's, um, I don't have an answer, I don't have a favorite because it's always changing, um, but to not give no answer, I will say it's, it's the surprise that I have, like, this game is huge. Every time I play it, there's always something I'm learning, whether it's a historical fact I didn't know, or a gameplay system that interacts in a way that it, you know, I didn't quite understand how cool that was going to be. So the constant surprise I have, uh, working, the, the team's incredibly smart, um, they outsmart themselves and each other by making it even cooler, and then we've got to raise the cool over here, so it just keeps getting better and better, and um, that, that surprise of not knowing quite what's coming next, even though I have a roadmap for it, um, is, is still really awesome and probably one of my favorite parts until I get another answer. <laughs> <laughs> and my answer is the same as it was yesterday. Uh, you all took my answers, so I have nothing else except for the Jira thing. So I loved it all. That's a cop out. <laughs> His favorite thing's coming here and chatting to all of you. I've decided I've it, It's the food. I mentioned it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but he hasn't had Tim Tams yet. You haven't tried Australian cuisine. When do you leave? Saturday. Sunday. 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 Well, yeah, I guess I'm leaving Sunday now. Yeah. <laughs> Tim Tams. Get him the Tim Tams before he goes, please. That is unfortunately all we have time for today, though. I wish we could keep talking because I, I love Civ. You guys love Civ. That's why you're here. You guys love Civ. That's why you're here. I mean, it, it does pay your bills as well, but you love Civ. <laughs> yes. And it comes across. So thank you uh, for sharing all of that. If you want to catch these guys, they will be in the meet and greet room from, we spoke about this before, and I don't remember if it was 3 or 3.30 now because Matt confused me. 3 30, right? You got it. Yeah. 3 30. I've basically. been a half an hour off on everything. So, <laughs> <There you 3:30. laughs> so uh, catch them in the meet and greet room from 3 30 so you can meet them and talk to them a little bit more, pick their brains a little bit. Uh, but Civ, Sid Meier's Civilization 7 comes out February 11, 2025. Uh, it's available to pre order today on PC and on consoles as well. Uh, for Raxus's next developer live stream is focused on the exploration age, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Um, follow them on social media if you aren't already. And check out the game guides on civilization.com for more details on the leaders and just their empires, what they can do. Just all of the awesome things that they've implemented into this game. It's sounding very different from Civ 6, and I am very excited. I've said this a lot, I'm sorry, it's not about me, but I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm very excited. Can we please give another round of applause to our team? Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Galaxy, and thank you all for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And that's literally it. So if someone wants to say something as we walk out, feel free. It's not my job anymore. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> it's my wife.